we expect to raise the key ECB interest rates again in September. I think those who boldly said inflation has peaked and it's coming down may have to change their minds. If the medium-term inflation outlook persists or deteriorates, a larger increment will be appropriate at our September meeting. We're prepared for a substantial economic slowdown uh, towards, the, towards the end of this year and into next year. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. The Hawks seize control. Christine Lagarde said, well, lays the groundwork for the ECB's first rate hike in over a decade and signals more to come. Italian yields jump, but the euro tumbles. China inflation actually moderates as commodity prices cool and consumer demand weakens, leaving room for government stimulus. And next up, of course, is U.S. CPI, which is forecast to top 8% again. Mohamed Elarian says there's still worse to come. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says there's nothing to suggest a recession is in the works. Now, first thing is first, let's check in on the markets. And what the markets are looking at is, of course, all of those inflation figures, ones we've had and the ones that are coming. Now, a little bit of pressure on these European stocks, 600. Again, trader anxiousness out there that monetary policy will be uh, too aggressive in dealing with inflation and therefore hurt growth. You're seeing European stocks down 1.2 percent. Extremely interesting to see also how markets and traders are reacting to the ECB uh, hawkishness yesterday. Not that much movement on euro and then S&P 500 futures pretty much flat. Now, this is where the action is happening. I think there was an interview uh, by our with Mr. Horbin over in France with the French central bank governor, and he was very clear. He said, look, the ECB has the tools and will deal with fragmentation, even if it's something that Madame Lagarde did not explicitly say yesterday, that 10-year yield on the Italy 3.66 and the German bond 142 for the yield. Now, if you look at the European map, it's not really a tale of two uh, stories because most of them are actually in the red with the FTSE, the CAC, and over the DAX uh, down between 9 tenths and 1.5 percent. Maybe, just maybe, we'll get a bit of solace when we get that inflation print from the U.S. a little bit later on. Now, the ECB has brought down the curtain on years of ultra-loose monetary policy. Policy officials committed to a quarter-point rate hike next month and signaled a bigger one to come in the autumn as fresh forecasts showed a faster pace ahead of prices than earlier thought. Now, President Christine Lagarde defended policymakers who got it so wrong on inflation. All international institutions all forecasters of repute have actually made the same mistake uh, of underestimating or not anticipating some of the developments such as the war, such as the energy crisis. Now, for more, we're joined by our Maria Tadeo in Brussels. So, Maria, we've learned a lot more on the ECB's policy path than expected. What exactly are traders not convinced about? Uh, look, Francine, I think more than the rate path, because she was very clear and calibrated it very well. We're going into July with uh, 25 basis points. She was asked, why not do it now? And she repeated, well, this is all about the forward guidance. We want to be very clear and very transparent. So on that front, I think it was very clear the fact that she didn't push back on the 50 basis points in September, too, I think also gave uh, good guidance in terms of what's to come. But it was really about the fragmentation. And Francine, yesterday in Amsterdam, uh, you and I talked about this. There was a lot of anxiousness in the market going into the meeting that Christine Lagarde had to really address this issue head on. Fragmentation, can the ECB really provide some buffer and not just an abstract concept but actually show there's a tool in the works. And yesterday I counted the times she was asked four times repeatedly fragmentation repeated each time. We'll deal with it. We've done it in the past. We'll do it in the future. But there was no substance to it. And I think in many ways that is exactly what freaked out markets, particularly when you looked at the BTP move right Right after that decision, the lack of detail around it. Yes, yeah, so th this is a win for the Hawks. It is, Francine, in, in many ways. And we talked about it, too, yesterday. Uh, we were in, in Amsterdam, and it really did feel the setting also. A, a central bank that had been very hawkish on the inflation print. A central banker had spoken about the need of really tackling this issue uh, head on. And, and yesterday, uh, she was accompanied, of course, by the Dutch central banker. And it did feel like this is the start of something new for the European central bank. I'm not sure whether uh, we should say the hawks will be in command uh, for the foreseeable future. And that is the end of it for, for Christine Lagarde's 
term, but I do think that there was really a change in the language. There was a change in the dynamics there, and it was really in many ways the end of that era. You know, it's now very clear that we're in for liftoff, and of course, a lot of questions around the volatility that it could trigger in the bond market, also exacerbated by the fact, again, going back to the fragmentation question, that yesterday there wasn't a lot of substance around what will the ECB do if the spillover from this actually becomes a problem, particularly across the periphery. Yeah, and Maria, of course, you know, we'll see how that plays out also in terms of fragmentation or certainly whether markets continue pushing the ECB for more concrete answers on how they would deal with fragmentation. Thank you so much, I'm Maria Tadeo there covering the ECB for us. Now, we're also joined by Annika Trion, Managing Director at Van Lanschot Kempen. Annika, thank you for joining us. I mean, so many questions actually on how much the markets will test the ECB's resolve right now. Yeah, hi, good, good morning, Francine. So I, I absolutely agree with uh, what was earlier said. So, you know, regarding the ECB statements, we all anticipated a 25 basis point hike. I think the two things that stood out, first of all, it's simply the ECB taking a leaf out of the Fed's book in terms of really starting to provide visibility in terms of the road ahead. And the second point, all about fragmentation. I think that was probably one of the larger disappointments areas what new tools in the toolbox does the ECB have to prevent a resurgence of this, you know, European sovereign crisis, which we suffered from after the, you know, global financial crisis? So, Anna, do you think the markets actually will test them in the next couple of days to, to have, I guess, that question answered concretely with some steps? Absolutely. I think you, you already saw the first tests already start taking place yesterday, immediately after the announcements. Looking at the spreads between Italian 10 years, German 10 years, we're almost, we're almost approaching the 250 basis points of 2020 when the ECB was forced to start moving aggressively. So, absolutely. Uh, there was an interesting blog post actually by uh, Mattis Muller, uh, ECB governing council member, saying that hesitation when it comes to dealing with inflation makes the job a lot more difficult. We used to worry about a policy mistake so that they would hike too much and then they'd have to reverse it possibly in 2024 or even quicker. Are we thinking about things wrong? Yeah, I mean, it's in a way, I think you, you could actually think of what is how the ECB is behaving and the fact that, you know, Europe is essentially a quarter or so behind the curve versus the US. And you know, you saw the big, you know, the big sort of aha moment that we got it wrong, transitory is wrong. Then there was the fear that actually central banks are going to be far too hawkish. And I think now we're sort of in total discovery mode. You know, ultimately when it boils down to the real economy, it's all about the fact that consumer confidence actually across the globe is shockingly low. I mean, it's back at sort of again the global financial crisis level, which is remarkable. Because in that period, we saw jobs losses of hundreds of thousands of jobs being lost on a monthly basis, at least in the U.S. Right now, it's the exact opposite. It's hundreds of thousands of jobs being created. Mm -hmm. So despite such a strong labor market, despite such a strong equity value of people's households, confidence is very, very low. That's all because of inflation. Despite confidence being very low, consumer spending is actually held up very strongly because people are essentially eating into their pent-up savings. And at a certain point, that has to stop. It's not sustainable. And that's why it's all about inflation. And that's why it's all about how are central banks going to be proactive enough, yet not too aggressive, to achieve its goals. So what does that mean for investment strategy? Where, do, where, do, where should we look for opportunities? Yeah, I mean, it's right, right now, the big question is, you know, talking about the PEs and talking about the E's. So we've all seen a huge uh, multiple D rating of two to three to even four PE points on stocks. The E has actually held, well, the earnings estimates by analysts have actually held up remarkably strong, uh, much stronger than people would have expected. So it's either a function of, well, actually earnings are going to hold up stronger because companies haven't shown alarming signs yet, or analysts simply being too conservative and rather slow in making those cuts. Um, if, you, if you believe in the latter, then you could argue that, well, actually, We've not seen as much multiple derating as we could, so there's, there's more to go. If you believe in the former, you could sort of start you know, delving into the ease. In terms of asset allocation, what, what that means and what that results in is being very, very fundamental, really zoning in into those earnings and looking at what are the realistic estimates and what is the realistic multiple yeah. to put on that and are there any specific opportunities. 
And Annika, I guess, you know, following on from that, so there's a lot of homework that people have to go and do to figure that out, is how do you deal with dwindling liquidity in the markets? Yep, so that, that, that's such an important phenomena, and it's something we don't have enough track record in because we've never actually experienced a long QT period. You know, we had the 2018 and 19, but that was very, very brief. And ultimately, if we've been enjoying 10 years of a liquidity pump into the markets that have had all sorts of obvious effects, but also ripple effects, and that being weaned away, I mean, it's starting in the US, it hasn't even started in Europe yet. What does that mean? And to your point about the homework, you certainly can't, you can't hope to free ride anymore. It's a lot more work if that support factor is gone. Annika, thanks so much. Annika Trion there from Van Lanschot Kempen staying with us. Now, coming up, just days after Shanghai celebrates its reopening after two months of brutal lockdown, millions are sent back to their homes after the return of COVID to the city. That story is up next, and this is Bloomberg. seeing a, a, a healthy level of, of resilience and recovery in, in, uh, in markets like Hong Kong, uh, who are one of the later countries, obviously, or markets to come out of the, uh, out of the pandemic, uh, obviously seeing severe disruptions in China, uh, but uh, encouraged that economic activity in China, despite the, uh, the, the lockdowns in Shanghai and elsewhere, uh, economic activity remains pretty strong. Standard Charter Chief Executive Officer there, Bill Winters, showing his confidence in China despite its zero COVID policy. Now, just days after the city was reopened, China is once again locked down or locking down millions of people in Shanghai. That's after daily cases jumped to six on Thursday. Several districts will be closed for the weekend to allow for mass testing. Well, Annika Trion from Van Lanschot Kempen is still with us. So, Annika, how do you play China right now? Yep, yeah, it's... China has been such a basket case, actually, since early 2017, because it started off with a hit on the real estate sector. Um, next, after that, there was a much more stringent approach to local tech, but also global tech, which raised a lot of governance question marks in the region. And obviously, the zero tolerance policy um, alongside a, you know, an enormous uh, new wave of COVID and also deaths makes it, makes it very, very complicated. And um, I think, well, the ultimate factor people are looking at is to really understand what kind of monetary supports can be provided there to cushion um, some of the demand weakness that we see as a result of it. So do you think that they'll be able to keep a handle on it through monetary policy, through government support? Well, what's interesting is you do see that there are, there are, they are certainly pledging regarding you know, making monetary policy moves, but we haven't really seen anything tangible yet. And it's been much more on the fiscal stimulus side. But that's certainly, that's certainly something which people are going to be paying a lot of attention to, especially given you know, yet another negative surprise regarding, uh, regarding Shanghai. Yeah, at the same time, we had news this week over, for example, then easing some of the restrictions with gaming and things like that. So does it go hand in hand? Absolutely. I think, I think ultimately, from a governance perspective, the more sort of credibility, the more comfort that investors can see from investing in a governance climate in China, that's key. And next to that, really understanding to what extent can demand be cushioned amongst, you know, persisting uncertainty around the COVID waves. And I think the point is, it's not just about asset allocators investing in China per se. It's about the read through, which is, which is global, which is the fact that we've always relied on China being a global pillar um, in terms of economic growth. Um, also, you know, what that means on commodities, on metals, where China demand has always been an enormous driver um, of certain metal pricing. Annika, thank you so much. Annika Trion, their managing director at Van Lanschot Kempen. Now, let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Alice Atkins. Hi, Alice. Hi, Francine. U.S. lawmakers investigating last year's riot at the Capitol on January the 6th have accused the then President Donald Trump of inciting his supporters and then rebuffing pleas to call off the mob. The panel opened public hearings for the primetime TV presentation. In video testimony, then Attorney General William Barr said some of the fraud claims that Trump pursued were publicly completely nonsense. President Trump had told them, 
that the election was stolen and that he was the rightful president. President Trump summoned the mob, assembled the mob, and lit the flame of this attack. Outgoing Hong Kong Chief Executive Carrie Lam says the city can't function as a global financial hub if quarantine controls remain in place. The city still imposes a mandatory seven-day hotel quarantine on international arrivals, despite business groups' call for it to end. Hong Kong's border with mainland China has been closed for more than two years. A report has found the UK spent £4 billion on unusable personal protective equipment during the pandemic and now plans to burn significant volumes of it. Parliament's Public Accounts Committee says millions of items of kit didn't meet official standards. It says the government lost three quarters of all money spent on PPE in the first year of Covid due to inflated prices and faulty kit. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. This is Bloomberg. Francine. Thank you so much, Alice. Now, coming up, could 3M be about to face criminal charges in Belgium? The U.S. chemicals giant is accused of a polluting land in Antwerp. That's the subject of today's Bloomberg Big Take. We'll have more on that story next, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, the fight over a tunnel project in Antwerp has revealed extraordinary levels of toxins in the water, soil and people near the company's factory. This time, there could be criminal charges. Bloomberg's Big Take looks into the forever chemicals crisis in Europe. Well, joining us now is Bloomberg Stephanie Baker, who broke the story, who's investigated the story right from the beginning. So, Stephanie, 3M is now being investigated for illegally dumping waste. How did this come out? Right. So um, they have produced, 3M has produced so-called forever chemicals uh, in Antwerp since the mid-70s. And at the same time, there had been this long-running plan to build a major tunnel highway project um, right there to close Antwerp's ring road. And the tunnel would pop out uh, right next to 3M's plant. And in the process of building this tunnel, a huge amount of soil would be displaced. So scrutiny of that plan to to, to dump some of the soil in different parts of uh, the Antwerp province, led environmentalists to uncover the extent of the contamination. Uh, and, um, you know, what came out was the fact that 3M had struck a, a secret agreement with the state-owned highway company to build this massive wall of toxic soil on 3M's site. In the, in the process, they tested local residents and realized that the vast majority of them have levels of this uh, forever chemical called PFOS in their bloodstream uh, above European safety limits. Um, and it's caused a mm -hmm. political scandal in Belgium, a parliamentary commission. There's a criminal probe and there are various civil complaints underway. Um, and it's a, a series of legal challenges that suspended the construction of this $5 billion tunnel highway project. Mm -hmm. So you spoke, uh, Stephanie, to residents who tested for very high levels of PFAs. How worried are they? Yeah, I think they are really worried. I mean, some some have ignored it, but those people that live close to the 3M plant are very worried. And I think there's a level of anxiety and concern about their own health, about how the government is handling it, and you know how they might be compensated for both the loss of uh, you know value to their home. You know, ho home house values have have gone down in that area, as well as their own health problems, and PFOS uh, is associated with a number of health conditions, including mm -hmm. hormone and uh, uh, immune deficiencies, um, high cholesterol, yeah. diabetes, uh, weakened vaccine e efficacy. So I think there's a, a lot of anxiety in the local community about the future. So Stephanie, what does this mean for 3M longer term? Right. So 3M is, has committed already uh, uh, almost 300 million euros to clean up 
the area, both the groundwater and um, the initial uh, zones uh, that have been contaminated. But it looks like they're facing a much bigger uh, price tag to fix this problem long term. They are being ordered by the government to draw plans to remediate the residents who live in the vicinity of the factory. And that plan entails scraping off huge amounts of dirt around people's homes in order to clean up the area. Um, and I think the final price tag remains up in the air at this point until they yep. draw up a, a full cleanup plan and you know, document the extent of the contamination. Stephanie, thank you so much. As always, it was some truly great investigative journalism. Stephanie Baker there. And if you'd like to read Stephanie's piece, just type an I big take on your Bloomberg terminal. Coming up, it's all about inflation. We'll get the latest on price pressures in Europe, the U.S. and China, and also the U.K. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. Sees control. Christine Lagarde lays the groundwork for the ECB's first rate hike in over a decade and signals more to come. Italian yields jump, but the euro tumbles. China inflation moderates as commodity prices cool and consumer demand weakens, leaving room for government stimulus. And next stop is U.S. CPI, which is forecast to top 8% again. Mohamed Delarian says there's still worse to come, while Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says there's nothing to suggest a recession is in the works. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Aqua here in London. Now, European stocks extending losses this morning as inflation fears grip the markets once again. We have reporters around the world on the latest price pressures. Covering the ECB is our Europe correspondent, Maria Tadeo. Our chief Asia economics correspondent has the latest on China and the U.S. And our EMEA EcoGov correspondent, Lizzie Burden, has the details on the U.K. So first, let's go to China. Data this morning showed inflation moderating in May, a cooling in global commodities to prices and weaker consumer demand is giving the government more room to ease policy and add stimulus to shore up the economy. And uh, what were the key takeaways from those inflation figures? A pretty soft inflation read in China, Francine, at 2.1 percent on the consumer side of things, even though prices for fresh fruit and veg did skyrocket. That was offset, offset by a big 20 odd percent fall in prices for pork, for example. And then, of course, we know the broader consumer story is one of being quite cautious and subdued due to the ongoing aggressive COVID lockdown. So the end result was consumer inflation came in 2.1 percent, not going to unsettle anybody. On the produce, producer price side of things, that came in at 6.4 percent. Also a cooling reflecting a base effect from a year ago and the fact that commodity prices have come off a little bit. So uh, taken all together, it means that if anything, China could become a source of disinflation for the world economy as opposed to a source of inflation. And there's certainly nothing stopping policymakers now from putting extra money into the economy to support demand. Yeah, and, uh, and then, of course, we have the big one, U.S. inflation. We see that pace, is, I mean, steady, but it's still 8.5% or, or around there. I mean, it's huge, huge figure. Yeah, exactly, Francine. The, the number tonight is expected to kind of reinforce that in U.S. inflation may have peaked. There are some signs from some of the core indicators that U.S. inflation may have peaked. But as you say, it's still going to come in somewhere around 8.3%. That's not very far from the peak of 8.5% back in March and it'll, it would only add to the debate that the Fed still has to keep jacking up, jacking up interest rates maybe by another 50 this month and next month because even if it is peaking inflation around 8 percent is still a long way from where the Fed wants it at 2 percent so the Fed debate will remain live for many months despite today's reading I think. All right, thank you so much, and a current there. Let's also move on to the UK. The Bank of England survey on inflation expectations dropping, I think, just moments ago. Lizzie, if you look at what we know, so UK inflation expectations rise to 4.6% in May. How does that factor into what the BOE will do? Well, it shows that you've got these second round effects in the UK, people losing faith in the Bank of England to do its job and control inflation. Of course, you had all that criticism from ministers recently about just that. This will be watched closely by officials in terms of the decision on Thursday. Bloomberg Economics is expecting a 25 basis point hike to 1.25%. Then you'll get three more hikes uh, before the end of the year. Markets a little bit more hawkish. They see a 50 basis point hike somewhere in there. But the rhetoric 
rhetoric is going to be more hawkish this time than last meeting? Because, of course, you had that £15 billion fiscal support package since Rishi Sunak, since the last decision. So is this really a template of what the rest of the world is living through? Well, uh, it's different in the UK because of what I'm just saying about the inflation expectations. You've got more second round effects here. People compensating for inflation by asking for wage rises and are inflation pictures less tied directly to the global commodity price growth than in other countries. Those were the warnings we had yesterday. Uh, but the, the, the decision is more likely to be a split between 25 basis points and 50 basis points in the UK rather than between to hike or not to hike. Lizzie, thanks so much. Lizzie Burden there with the very latest on the UK. Now, the ECB has brought down the curtain on years of ultra-loose monetary policy. Policy officials committed to a quarter point rate hike next month, signaling a bigger one to come in the autumn as fresh forecasts showed a faster pace ahead for prices than earlier thought. Well, President Christine Lagarde defended policymakers who got it so wrong on inflation. All international institutions, all forecasters of repute have actually made the same mistake uh, of underestimating or not anticipating some of the developments such as the war, such as the energy crisis. There you go. Inflation, wrap, uh, that is Endocurrent and Lizzie Burden. We'll have plenty more, of course, on inflation. Also, coming up, not the man for the job, that was one of the comments that Aviva chief executive Amanda Blank faced at the insurer's AGM last month. We're joined next by Mary Ann Siegert to discuss why women may still struggle to be taken seriously in their professional careers. This is Bloomberg. for consumers worldwide that Apple is now embracing a better form of consumer credit. Um, we're looking at an industry uh, of retail banking payments that you know has an addressable market of $440 billion worldwide. And it has been constructed in a way traditionally where credit cards have been making a fortune by trying to get us to revolve at high interest rates once we get that credit card statement every month. And this form of credit is better for consumers. So I think it's 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 fantastic. And Klan has been offering this form of credit for a while. I actually would be mostly worried if I was one of those credit card banks who embraced Apple Pay, was so happy to embrace this new technology, and now suddenly find myself having this company in front of my credit card promoting an interest-free credit instead of my 40% revolving credit one, and then pushing that customer to another provider I, I that that's the that to me should be the big headline of this news for us I mean Klarna has 150 million users worldwide we're uh, one of the largest third-party global payment networks in the world paying for is a fantastic product it has done tremendously well for us in the US and helped us a lot to gain recognition and so forth but people are using us for a lot of reasons one not the least being the fact that we're the richest data payments networks in the world because we have SKU level data and digital receipts on every transaction, allowing us to create a much richer, richer consumer experience. 40% of our transactions are debit, not even credit. People don't know that um, and so forth. So, so I mean, I, I'm, I'm welcoming it. I always think competition is nice. And I'm, I'm also fortunate to have a neighbor here in Daniel Eck, the founder of Spotify, who has, has, can give me some tips on how to compete with Apple successfully, obviously, over the year. Well, that was the Clarence Chief Executive Officer Sebastian Shematovsky speaking to Bloomberg last night. Now let's get straight to your Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Alice Atkins. Hi, Alice. Hi, Francine. State, State Street says it is not pursuing any acquisition or business combination with Credit Suisse. The denial comes a day after a Swiss blog reported on a possible bid for the Zurich-based bank. State Street says there is no basis to the rumours. The CEO of Credit Suisse called a question about a possible takeover, quote, stupid. Brazil is set to give up its controlling stake in power utility Eltrobas through, though, through a share sale that could raise $7 billion. The Rio-based company, Latin America's biggest power supplier, is issuing new shares, while national development bank BNDES is selling part of its holdings. The government is expected to use the proceeds to finance subsidies and other relief measures ahead of October's election. Stanley Druckenmiller is warning Wall Street that the sharp, sharp decline in the stock market isn't over just yet. The chairman and CIO of Duquesne Family Office, 
told the Sony Investment Conference that his best guess is that we're six months into a bear market. He says it's, quote, highly, highly probable that the bear market has a way to run. Outgoing Hong Kong Chief Executive Carrie Lam says the city can't function as a global financial hub if quarantine controls remain in place. The city still imposes a mandatory seven-day hotel quarantine on international arrivals, despite business groups' call for it to end. Hong Kong's border with mainland China has been closed for more than two years. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Francine? Thank you so much, Alice. Now, Aviva Chief Executive Amanda Blank said that the amount of sexism she encounters at work has worsened as she has risen through the ranks of finance. Blank has been actively speaking out following the insurer's AGM last month, where one shareholder suggested she was not the man for the job. Well, we're now joined by Marianne Seagart, author of The Authority Gap. Through data research and interviews with the likes of Hillary Clinton and Sherry Blair, Marianne reveals at the scale of the gap that still persists between men and women. Well, she joins us now. Marianne, thank you for joining us. Is the gap getting worse or better? I do think it's necessarily getting worse, though there is a real backlash against women speaking out online. I think it's probably very, very slowly getting better, but I'd just like to hurry it up. We are getting more women in senior positions, which is fantastic, but as Amanda Blank revealed, they still get subject to very sexist comments and quite a lot of misogynistic behaviour. And I just think it's time to call this out and do something about it. Uh, Marianne, does calling it out actually makes a difference to the way these women can conduct their jobs? Or how do you see the parallels in this? Well, I think that a lot of men actually do it unconsciously. They don't do it deliberately. And I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt. Some of them do it deliberately, but a lot of them do it unconsciously. So, for instance, they will just take up disproportionate speaking time in a meeting. Or they will interrupt women much more than they will interrupt men. And as I say, they're not doing it consciously, but I think that if we start to help them become more aware of this sort of behaviour, they might genuinely want to change it. Marian, I feel like we've been talking about this for the last 10 years, and certainly um, even Sheryl Sandberg was talking about this in Lean In. Are things getting better as a lot of private companies give, you know, if not mentoring, certainly uh, give bias awareness, or what's the right way to deal with it then? Well, unconscious bias training does help to raise awareness, but it doesn't actually change your behaviour unless you really undertake to do so. It's a bit like going to a lecture about how much carbs and fat intake will affect your weight. It won't actually help you lose weight unless you do something about it. Um, and I think the trouble is with things like Lean In, what they were effectively saying was the problem lies with women and that women need to be more confident, more assertive and to lean in. What I'm saying is that it's not women we need to fix. It's how we all perceive and react to and interact with women that needs to change. Because actually, if women just lean in and act as confidently and as assertively as men, they often get punished for it. People start to use adjectives about them like yeah. abrasive or strident or aggressive or bossy, you know, all these adjectives that are never used of men showing exactly the same character traits. And that's because we still nurture these incredibly old-fashioned and outdated stereotypes somewhere in the darker recesses of our brains that tell us that women ought to be warm and kind and gentle and unassertive and unthreatening. Right. As soon as they start to behave in the way that they have to behave in order to be taken seriously, that makes us feel really but uncomfortable. Marianne, and we how do you can't yeah how do you counteract this so you know they're gender neutral for example toys we've been we've been talking about this for such a long time and again yeah. we were talking about of course the chairwoman who said well she's not the right man for the job i mean th the person who said that was shamed on social media yeah and so that helps i think i think how we counteract it is just being more aware of our behavior so for instance if we see a woman in authority or indeed a woman standing running for office and we say oh they're really not likable we should question ourselves and, and ask, is it actually, is it she who isn't unlikable? Or is it my reaction to her that's making me think that she's unlikable? And if these adjectives like, you know, abrasive and strident and aggressive and bossy start cropping up in our brains, we can think, ah, that's my unconscious bias talking. It's not actually the woman concerned who is those things. We just need to be much more aware that unconscious bias yeah. manifests itself in our own thoughts and behavior. So, Marianne, do you think this is a particularly British problem or are you really oh, no. seeing this worldwide? It's absolutely universal. 
And you know, I talk to women from all over the world. And of course, in countries such as Pakistan or Saudi Arabia, the sexism is overt. It's, it's not even covert. But in the Western world, in, in the UK, in the US, even in Scandinavian countries, which are probably more egalitarian than ours, we still see this sort of behavior happening. Men monopolizing conversational time, men interrupting women, men underestimating women and challenging their expertise and resisting their authority. It happens all over the world to a greater or lesser degree, but nonetheless, it's everywhere, I'm afraid. So, Marianne, let's say you're in a board meeting, there are, you know, uh, five men, five women, the men talk over the women. Who should, deal, who should intervene? Like, you know, if we game theory that, what's the right way to deal with it? Okay, so the ideal thing is that the chair of the meeting intervenes and says, hang on a minute, I was really interested in what Marianne was saying there. Or suppose I make a point and no one takes any notice and a man makes exactly the same point 10 minutes later and it's treated like the second coming. I mean, this is a very common phenomenon. You know, the chair should say, oh, I'm so pleased you agree with what Marianne said earlier. If the chair's not doing it, ideally, someone else around the table will do it. Because, of course, if a woman speaks up and says, hang on a minute, I said that 10 minutes ago, or stop interrupting me, you know, or please let me finish, quite often she then gets characterized as difficult or spiky or oversensitive. So what we right. really need is allies around the table, male or female. Marianne, thank you so much. Marianne Seagard, there, author of The Authority Gap, joining us this morning. Now, coming up, the BTP boon spread hits the wildest since May 2020. We talk all things European bonds with Ven Ram from our Markets Life team. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. I have no reason to have a different forecast from the consensus of 0.5 and 0.7 month on month. But what worries me, John, and you're not going to like this because it's looking forward, the June month on month print will be worse than the May month on month print. I think those who boldly said inflation has peaked and it's coming down may have to change their minds. I, I wouldn't surprise me if we see a headline print that's much higher than the 8.5. Next month, Mohammed, why? Not, not as early as next month, because we, first the drivers of inflation are broadening, and that's due to the Fed policy mistake. Secondly, at the headline level, energy prices are going up month on month, quite dramatically. And thirdly, we're seeing pressure uh, pressure on shelter and food. So if you look at all the components, it's way too early, unfortunately to say that inflation has peaked. I hope it has, but it would not surprise me if we go above 8.5% on, on a yearly basis. Hey, Mohammed, this is really important. I remember when you gave me the call last year, early last year, and you said, I don't think this is transitory. This is important. I'm pushing back. And you went out there in force, and that force got more powerful as the year progressed. I get the feeling this year, Mohammed, that we still haven't totally relinquished this idea that a lot of this is temporary. I hear from a lot of guests who think that we've seen the peak, a mechanical peak year over year, and for good reason, and they think the Fed backs away in September. Are you stressing this is going to persist through the whole of this year, that we're not going to get that drop-off that so many people are hoping for, looking for? John, if we get a drop-off, we'll get it for the wrong reason. We'll get it because of demand destruction, and that would be tragic. The last thing we need is for inflation to completely undermine the demand side, because then we have not only a price issue, but we have an income issue. And once again, it will be the most vulnerable segments of the population that get hit the hardest. So in a way, be careful what you wish for. So if you believe the labor market stays strong, wages remain buoyant and start catching up to inflation then it's very hard to see inflation coming down. If, however, you think that we're going to have a recession, sure, inflation is going to come down, but that's not the sort of transitory inflation that anybody wants.
Bloomberg opinion columnist Mohamed Ilarian there giving his take on the ECB president Christine Lagarde's press conference and his outlook for inflation in Europe and America. Now, economists are expecting U.S. inflation figures to show persistent price increases at over 8 percent. But Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said that while there's a risk of higher food and energy prices, there's also nothing to suggest a recession is in the works. While our MLive editor Van Ram agrees if U.S. yields are on the right track. Well, our MLive editor, Ven Ram, joins us. Ven, first of all, you really pulled out my heartstrings today because you were talking about Italian BTPs, periphery bonds, and espresso. So 100% support you in anything that has to do with espressos. What is your main worry, that, w that we look at treasuries or that we actually misprice some of the periphery bonds? Well, I don't think there's uh, any uh, mispricing in periphery bonds. Yesterday, as the ECB came out, they the, uh, the, the, the guidance was such that it, it paved the door open for a 50 basis point move in uh, September. And that kind of meant that the market had to rework the uh, ECB calculus. And now, after the ECB, they were pricing 150 basis points of tightening in the remainder of the year, as opposed to 125 yeah. for the ECB. And that meant that bonds had to reprice. And that's what we saw yesterday. If you look at it today, the bonds have come off a bit and the yields have come off a bit. And that kind of supports the argument that it was more like a one day move. We are nowhere near a fragment, risk of fragmentation yet. But if the moves get disorderly over a period of time, that's when the ECB is more likely to be concerned. But events, and we're hearing, I'm, I'm counting like four or five ECB governing council members giving interviews today on the back of that ECB decision. Uh, the French governor saying that actually the markets should have no doubt that the ECB will combat, um, of course, fragmentation and has the will and the means to do it. Do you agree or do you think that the markets will try and push to get an answer what that looks like? The markets will eventually try to push uh, the ECB to see what their tolerance limit is. But I don't think with them not having even raised rates, even for the first time, um, that's going. That's a, pro a prospect just yet. Down the line, it's going to be an issue, definitely, because uh, the ECB, if they raise, start raising rates, the deposit rates beyond 1% territory, I think that that's when peripheral yields will blow out. And at that point, the ECB will be forced to reveal its backstop because these southern European economies are indebted to the indebted to the gills, and that has to be priced into the market if boon deals are going to go higher. And so it is going to be an ongoing conversation in the coming months, but not just yet, I believe. So then on the U.S., what do you think yields are really telling us about a U.S. recession? I don't think we are on the cusp of a U.S. recession anytime soon, not for the next 12, 14 months at any rate. Yes, we did have an inversion in the two stents curve, but historically, if you go back, what you see is that what has proved to be a watertight signal is an inversion not only of one segment of the curve, but multiple segments of the curve. And a key segment of the curve that's got to invert is the three months, 10 year. In the absence of an inversion of both those segments of the curve, it's like more likely to prove uh, to be a false alarm, as has happened before in 1998, when the two-year 10-year inverted without the three months 10-year inverting within a few months. So if you pull all that together, what you get is that yeah. a recession is extremely unlikely before the second half of next yeah. year. Thank you so much, Ven. Smart on bonds, as always. And then we look at U.S. inflation. More Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition next. I think you could see a bear market rally. There's not a lot of inventory in the system, so that's why we think it's a, it's a little uh, recession. Still, the Federal Reserve moving a lot quicker. The uh, U.S. has a much larger inflation problem. There's a very narrow path between an inflation right. problem or a growth problem. It's way too early, unfortunately, to say that inflation has peaked. I hope it has, but it would not surprise me if we go above 8.5%. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Friday, June 10th. Our top stories today. Mohamed El Arian says U.S. inflation hasn't peaked. We'll see if he's right with today's CPI report, which is forecast to top 8% once again. 
China's moderating inflation is set to give policymakers more room for easing. Meanwhile, Shanghai prepares to lock down seven districts this weekend to conduct more COVID testing. And a House panel investigating the January 6th insurrection opened public hearings with a primetime TV presentation. We've got the latest on the findings about the Capitol riots. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York. And Kaylee, it feels like it's been a big week. There's a lot going on here in the markets post the ECB. We heard from China around inflation and we hear from the U.S. on inflation later today. Yeah, it's been a big week, Anna, but it is not over yet. We still have U.S. inflation data to get through and the entire session that follows. So really interested to see what that read is on CPI in about three and a half hours time, 8.30 a.m. Eastern. Now, of course, the Asia session already closed for the week before we got that inflation data. It was a bit mixed. You had stocks down in Japan, but higher in China and Hong Kong. Now, the good news in part in China is on the inflation data out overnight. Only 6.4% on producer price inflation. I say only, but that is down from the month of April. So that is a sign that they can continue to ease policy and boost stimulus. So you have the CSI 300 up about 1.5%, even in spite of news that Shanghai is going back into lockdown this weekend to conduct mass testing. Of course, the other thing investors in China and Chinese te technology stocks in particular are weighing is the regulatory crackdown. We did have some cold water thrown on that whole idea of an anti-IPO revival yesterday. Nonetheless, though, the Hang Seng Tech Index actually rose 1.6% in the Asian session. We also have to keep an eye on the Japanese yen. After five consecutive days of losses relative to the dollar, it is a stronger yen uh, this morning. 133.87 is where we trade. You now have the Bank of Japan, Japan's finance ministry, coming out saying we are concerned about how rapid the decline in the yen has been. We will take action if necessary. So that is supporting the currency. And finally, I would just point out that in the New Zealand bond market, we have seen the 10 year yield rise for nine days in a row, up seven basis points overnight. 3.925% is where we trade, Matt. That is the highest going all the way back to 2015. Yeah, I still find a yen at 133 and change pretty shocking. Right now, we see S&P futures bouncing back and forth between gains and losses. But of course, yesterday we had 2% drop in the cash trade and um, there's real concern. I'm not really sure if it comes from the ECB because didn't you expect that from the ECB? But obviously the widening spreads in the periphery are problematic. We'll hear about that from Anna in just a second. U.S. 10-year yield right now just over 3%, <clears throat> actually coming down a little bit, but higher than it was at this time yesterday, 3.0216. And as I was saying, when we see U.S. yields over 3% recently, that's definitely bad news for uh, for risk um, in terms of for risk assets. In terms of NYMEX crude right now, you see it coming up a little bit, but only at 121.69. Only I say because yesterday we were up over 122 for. Uh, text intermediate and Bitcoin right now off uh, half percent and just under thirty thousand dollars, but at twenty nine thousand nine hundred and ninety five, not far away. Anna, what do you see in terms of European markets? I see a lot of red on the screen today, Matt. That's what I see. The European equity markets firmly in red territory. And I'll draw your attention to this southern part of Europe here, the FTSE MIB, the benchmark over in Italy, down by 2.6% in today's session. Now, we knew we'd be weaker here in Europe today. We needed to play catch up with the latter day losses on Wall Street that you guys saw uh, in yesterday's session. But this has gone further and it has a dynamic of its own. There's certainly an, an Italian dimension which we need to discuss here. So I put the FTSE MIB in, shows it down by 2.6%. And in fact, nearly all stocks on the FTSE MIB are in negative territory. Unicredit is a good example of one of the banking stocks under pressure today. And you see at the bottom of the FTSE MIB, a lot of those financial services names lined up and losing ground today. This is a little bit of a tantrum in the bond markets, and it's certainly coming out of the periphery of Europe, and in particular, Italy and the short end. The two-year yield jumping today, just as it jumped yesterday. And we've seen, actually, the two-year yield gaining around 40 basis points, just less than 40 basis points since that ECB meeting. So this is moving pretty quickly as the markets adjust to a new regime, to higher interest rates still to come from the ECB. What there was not much mention of, or at least in the market's view, not enough mention of, was the tools that the ECB has available to it to tackle any fragmentation, any breakup risk around the euro. And so when there was not enough said about that, the market thinking seems to be, well, let's see if we can test the, Euros, uh, test the eurozone a little bit on that front. Uh, and that's what is happening here, it seems, in the Italian market. Now, no one's saying that this is 2011, but it's just a little flavour of that uh, to keep us on our toes.
close this morning. Credit Suisse down by 3.4%. One we talked about a lot, Kaylee, this week. And maybe this is the last day I'll put Credit Suisse in here. But just to uh, finish off that story after State Street came out with yet another statement, this time being more explicit, saying no, there's no uh, merit to these reports that we're interested in buying Credit Suisse. And so the stock falls today. Not anymore. Yeah, well, Anna, I'm sure a lot of Credit Suisse investors are going to be glad that they have a weekend and a couple days off uh, from that story. Now, of course, we are very close to the weekend, but we still have a full day to get through. As for what is ahead today, President Biden will be delivering marks at the Port of Los Angeles. He's going to be hosting a leader's retreat, a working luncheon with heads of state and government as part of the Ninth Summit of the Americas. Of course, he's probably going to talk about inflation as well. Then it's the Bank of Russia rate decision. That's at 6.30 a.m. Eastern time. And finally, the big event of the day, U.S. CPI data comes at 8.30 a.m. New York time, Matt. All right, we'll be watching for that for sure. Very closely, um, the inflation data is key, obviously. Speaking of that, Mohammed El Arian um, almost a year ago accurately forecast that elevated U.S. inflation would be persistent and not transitory. He says now it may not have peaked. He spoke with Bloomberg's John Farrow yesterday. What worries me, John, and you're not going to like this because it's looking forward, the June month-on-month -month print will be worse than the May month-on-month -month print. I think those who boldly said inflation has peaked and it's coming down may have to change their minds. Let's get more on today's U.S. CPI report with Bloomberg's Danny Berger. So, Danny, what are we expecting? Obviously, Mohammed thinks we haven't seen the peak, but others mm. have really boldly stepped out and said we have. Yeah, we've seen a lot of those bets come on, especially, you know, the retailers, the concern there of stockpiling people not buying as much. But look, at least for this figure of last month's CPI, it's definitely not going to show that we've already peaked. It's expected to be 8.3 percent for yet another month. Sure, some of the core might have cooled down, but it really is that energy picture and that food picture, all the commodities driving it higher. Now, this debate as to whether it's peaked, I do find it really fascinating because it's this, just this ever-evolving conversation around inflation. Is it transitory? How long will it last? If it is lasting, have we peaked? Is it just going to be high at a lower level? We did see some bets back off of that. Let me take you into the charts for our radio listening audience. I do have break-evens. I am armed with them today, 2, 5, and 10-year. And it did at first look like they peaked out around March and started to trend now, uh, downwards, but now they're just starting to get nudged up again. And this is the fear really present throughout the market. You have um, Michael Hartnett from Bank of America saying that we're still in inflationary shock. We're heading into a rate shock. And at the same time, growth shock comes next. That was also really echoed by Junkin Miller uh, yesterday at the Sone conference, Stanley Junkin Miller, um, saying that, look, he is concerned because inflation is high. The Fed's going to have to get aggressive. They're behind the curve, something a lot of people have said, saying that if you're predicting a soft landing, it's going against decades of history. For his part, Anna, he's not buying stocks. He's not buying fixed income. Basically, just commodities is all he's left with. Okay, buying commodities, still more room in that trade then, according to, uh, according to, the, uh, according to him. Now, Bloomberg, Stanley Berger, thank you very much for that. So China's uh, inflation picture, let's get to that story. It moderated in May, leaving room for authorities to ease monetary policy and add stimulus to shore up the economy. Meanwhile, Shanghai will lock down almost everyone in the city this weekend as COVID-19 cases continue to emerge. Let's get more with Enda Karin, our chief Asia economics correspondent. Enda, as soon as we get excited about reopening trades in China, we're greeted by new headlines of lockdowns. Bring us up to speed. Indeed, most of Shanghai will go back under lockdown this week and from mass testing. And that seems to be the approach that China is going to lean on now. They want frequent testing. They want to test large scale populations at any moment. And just as you said, when it appeared Shanghai was getting out of the lockdown, they're going backwards. The inflation numbers you mentioned, well, they told the story about the lockdowns as well. Consumer price is very subdued, 2.1%, really reflecting what's hurting, what's happening with consumers there, which is obviously pretty low confidence at the moment. The producer side of things which was also uh, subdued 6.4% representing uh, commodity prices coming off their boil and that weaker inflation will allow the authorities to put more support into the economy and uh, when you consider that Shanghai is going under another lockdown this, this weekend clearly more support will be needed. Well, and of course, the COVID zero policy, just the pandemic in general, and uh, has kept Chinese President Xi Jinping in mainland China for over two years. The last time he did a trip abroad was in January of 2020. And yet we have news now that he may be traveling to Hong Kong in a couple of weeks. 
He may be travelling and has been confirmed yet, but July 1 is an important political anniversary here for when China resumed control of Hong Kong 25 years ago. There are certainly our preparations going on on the ground here for a major leader to visit from Beijing. Uh, staff and various facilities and hotels are, are undergoing quarantine. A local school actually is going to go undergo quarantine so the kids can be ready to be part of the festivities. The thinking is that maybe a big leader from Beijing will come down and add to the reopening feel of, of Hong Kong as it diverges away from the main, mainland's policies and there's a hope that perhaps they might even ease up in the hotel quarantine required when you land here at the airport as well. But as I say, no confirmation of which leader is coming yet. All we know is that at least one state leader is expected to come and it's expected that uh, Hong Kong will edge towards reopening in the second half of the year. All right, and uh, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Enda Kern reporting from Hong Kong. Now, let's get back to the U.S. The House committee investigating the Capitol insurrection blamed then-President Donald Trump and his persistent denial of his loss of the election for triggering the deadly attack. It drew um, on video testimonies from the White House aides uh, at the time, text messages, and other materials. January 6th and the lies that led to insurrection have put two and a half centuries of constitutional democracy at risk. The world is watching what we do here. President Trump had told them that the election was stolen and that he was the rightful president. President Trump summoned the mob, assembled the mob, and lit the flame of this attack. Joe Matthew, Bloomberg Washington correspondent, joins us now for um, uh, more key moments from the hearing. Uh, how much weight did they bring to these allegations, Joe? Well, look, that's a good question. I don't want to necessarily judge this process here in what is the first of about a half dozen hearings. Uh, the final is also expected to air in prime time. Look, some of what we heard last evening, we've actually heard before. It had been leaked from this committee, including Donald Trump angry at the White House, reports from within the West Wing about his tacit approval of the attack as it was happening, his suggestion that Vice President Mike Pence deserved to be targeted by the mob. But we saw new footage from the attack last night, bringing back visceral memories of January 6th, the level of abuse that law enforcement took. As you can see, a Capitol Police officer there on the left of your screen testified what it was like to be knocked unconscious by the mob. The committee shared clips as well from high-ranking Trump White House officials, and it was remarkable to hear from them in their own words for the first time. Former Attorney General Bill Barr describing telling Donald Trump that claims of fraud were BS without saying the word. Trump's daughter Ivanka saying that she respected Barr and believed the AG at the time. Of course, Republicans, Matt, call this effort illegitimate and unconstitutional. But members of the panel say they will prove coordination, if not conspiracy, to overturn the election, beginning with a White House meeting in late December with Donald Trump, Rudy Giuliani, and Sidney Powell. They say it was just an hour after that meeting ended, Matt, that Donald Trump set the tweet saying that January 6th was the time to come to Washington. It's going to be wild. And over the next couple of weeks in these hearings, we're going to hear about the coordinated attack on the Capitol, according to the officials on this panel. And we'll look forward to your reporting on that over the next couple of weeks. Thank you so much to Bloomberg's Joe Matthew. And of course, you can also listen to Joe every weekday on his radio program, Sound On. That's at 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Bloomberg Radio. Now let's get back to the markets and take a look at some stocks moving in pre-market trading here in the U.S. A big underperformer today is DocuSign. This is the e-signature company allows you to sign documents digitally. It reported after the bell yesterday. Earnings missed expectations. It also cut its billing forecast for the year. Analysts say that's a sign of weak demand and the stock is getting brutally punished for it in pre-market this morning, down 24% before the bell. Another stock lower before the bell is Netflix. It was actually downgraded at Goldman Sachs. The analysts there putting $100 $86 price target on the stock. That's about a 3.5% decline from yesterday's close. And lo and behold, in pre-market trading, it's down a little more than 3%, trading at 186.80, so only 80 cents away from that new target. One more positive story, though, is really across the Chinese tech ADRs that trade here in the U.S. Of course, they all were down yesterday after that Ant Group IPO story was proven to be not really a story at all. Ant itself saying it doesn't have those plans. So Alibaba was down about 8% in the Thursday session. On this Friday morning, though, rebounding Anna, it's up about three and a half percent in early hours. 
OK, we'll continue to watch that. Coming up on the programme, we'll be back to the theme of inflation. Shemin Soa Power joins us, head of inflation trading at uh, the Bank of Ireland. What is the detail that she's watching for in today's CPI report that will help us understand the future direction of inflation and the future of finance? Goldman Sachs CEO David Solomon reveals his best guess about what changes will drive the industry over the next 30 years. Plus, the forever chemicals crisis has come to Europe. How a tunnel project revealed extraordinary levels of toxins near a uh, near a 3M factory in Antwerp. Read more by typing NI Big Take into your terminal. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. We are simulcast on both Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television. I'm Matt Miller here in New York. Kaylee Lyons, Anna Edwards with us out of London. Now, I'm looking at the uh, fragmentation, that is to say the spread between the peripheral countries' bond yields and the German Bund. Um, we are on the highway to the danger zone right now, as you can see from uh, this chart. <laughs> Joining us is Dana Albaltaji to talk about what this means for Christine Lagarde and the ECB. You know, a lot of people have said, Dana, that um, there, there might be a dual mandate for the ECB that we don't really know about. But actually, is it possible that fragmentation just leads to out-of-control inflation, and that's why they're so concerned about it? Uh, yeah, that's absolutely that's absolutely it. And what you're seeing in markets right now is a return to risk it's, it's, it's like a risk norm. You know, um, Italy for a long time was trading as though it was a lot stronger than it actually is. And it's now returning to a place where we understand it was before. However, this time around, because of all of the bonds that it issued throughout the last two years, it's got a lot more debt. So the, really, the concern that you're seeing here is that as that spread widens, people are starting to wonder how that debt burden will be handled. Yeah, Dana, especially as we've got one of the big buyers of this debt stepping away, and that's the ECB, of course. Um, it's not 2011. Help us to keep level heads here. We, exactly. we, haven't, got we haven't got spreads at, at those kinds of levels. But given we haven't even seen the ECB hike yet, and we're seeing this kind of response in credit markets, that, I suppose, is what makes some people nervous. This is exactly it. I mean, it's not just happening as rate rises are on the horizon. It's also happening as inflation is still red hot. It's also happening with the prospect of economic growth being slower than people hoped. So you've got a lot of elements here that is really raising the whole risk um, fear. Yeah, at least the whatever it takes guy is in charge. Exactly. So, you know, we've got that. But Dana, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Dana Albertaggi joining us there with the latest on the markets. And for more market analysis, check out MLIV Go on your terminal. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Matt Miller in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. Outgoing Hong Kong Chief Executive Carrie Lam says the city can't function as a global financial hub if quarantine controls remain in place. The city still imposes a mandatory seven-day hotel quarantine on international arrivals despite business groups' calls for it to end. Hong Kong's border with mainland China has been closed for more than two years. Meanwhile, Bloomberg has learned that UBS Group is losing two senior industrial investment bankers for China. Sources tell Bloomberg that Yang Kun Ho, a managing director, and David Chen, an executive director at UBS's investment bank in Hong Kong, have recently resigned. Bankers in Hong Kong and mainland China are struggling as an unprecedented crackdown on private enterprise and travel restrictions slow deal making. Amazon doesn't want to get into a bidding war for the rights to stream Indian Premier League cricket matches. Bloomberg has learned the company plans to withdraw from a heated competition for one of the world's most popular sporting contests. The surprise move leaves the field open to Ambani's Reliance, Disney and Sony. The rights have been estimated to fetch an unprecedented $7.7 billion. And the yen's pushing higher today after five straight days of losses. Japanese officials are concerned about the pace of the currency's decline. In a statement following a three-party meeting of Japan's finance, Ministry of Finance, the Bank of Japan, and the Financial Services Agency, officials said they would act appropriately 
if needed. The yen is trading back below 134 per dollar, but Matt, of course, that is still just off the weakest level for the yen, going all the way back to February of 2002. The differentials between the Bank of Japan keeping policy easy and central banks around the world, ECB included now, that are on a hawkish tightening path is quite wide. Yeah, well, if this is what hawkish looks like, I think someone should tell the ECB what other central banks are doing. But Fair. yeah, in terms of the yen, um, it is pretty amazing to see it at this level. And it'll be interesting to see what this means for Japan's economy, you know, in terms of mm. importing mm. deflation. Yeah, absolutely, with the uh, high cost of commodities as a result. And interesting to watch dollar yen when we get that CPI print, because if this is all about, uh, out of the U.S., I mean, because if this is all about interest rate deferentials, then what people read into the Fed's response could be interesting for dollar yen and other crosses. Coming up on this program, we'll talk about U.S. CPI. Uh, Shemin Soa Power joins us, head of inflation trading at Bank of Ireland. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Mohamed El Arian says U.S. inflation has not peaked. Today's CPI print is forecast to top 8% once again. China's moderating inflation is set to give policymakers more room for easing. Meanwhile, Shanghai prepares to lock down seven districts this weekend to conduct COVID testing. And a House panel investigating the January 6th insurrection opened public hearings with a primetime TV presentation. U.S. lawmakers have accused then-President Donald Trump of inciting his supporters and then ignoring pleas to call off the mob. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York. And Matt, European equity markets then are refusing to follow U.S. futures higher, it seems, this morning as we preoccupy uh, around stresses, uh, fragmentation potential for the periphery. Yeah, it's one of my new favorite words, actually, fragmentation. U.S. futures are higher, but only by six one hundredths of 1%. So it's not like um, we're headed to the moon. And of course, yesterday in the cash trade, we were down 2%. I think that's one of the biggest stories. You know, um, the fact that U.S. markets continue to crater by so much leads one to ask how much longer um, or how much further can this bear market uh, go, if you believe that it's a bear market. Right now, we see U.S. 10-year yield coming down as investors buy that debt, but it's still higher than where we were at this time yesterday. So three spot zero two seven one on the U.S. 10-year yield. And NYMEX crude is rising, but it's still lower than it was at this point yesterday, 121.83. Um, generally, we have a relatively high level on U.S. yields. We have a very high level on Texas Intermediate, and we have an incredibly boring, unchanged level <laughs> on Bitcoin, $30,024. I may make the call, Kaylee, to drop Bitcoin from this board unless it moves above 32 or below 28. Yeah, I want to go back and watch all of our shows from the last, call it, what, four weeks and see when the last time was that Bitcoin wasn't trading around that 30,000 range because it yeah. really has been a very, very long time. Now, there is some more interesting action happening beneath the surface of the market when it comes to pre-market trading and the fact that there is one stock that could lose a quarter of its value come the opening bell. That would be DocuSign, the e-signature company. It reported after the bell yesterday. Earnings missed expectations. It cut its billings forecast. As a result, that stock is down 24% in early hours. Some group of stocks getting a lift, though, including Chinese tech ADRs. They were all under pressure yesterday as there was questions around that anti-IPO revival. First, it was reported China was considering it. Then China and Ant said, no, that is not the case. So you saw those stocks pressured. But now investors seem to be deciding we are still optimistic that the worst of the regulatory crackdown is over, even if Ant does it ultimately IPO. So you're seeing Alibaba gaining back some of the losses of yesterday. It's up about 3.7% before the bell, as is Baidu and Didi Global. That Chinese ride hailing company is up by more than four percentage points, Anna. Yeah, so a lot of Chinese tech in focus there. And let's have a look at where we are in Europe. And it is, as I was saying earlier to Matt, a bit of a, a gloomy picture and one that fails to keep up or, or uh, fails to be dragged higher, if you like, by sentiment over in the United States. So Europe uh, seems to be in, a bit, of a, in a, bit, a bit of a gloomy place this morning. Stocks Europe 600 down by one and a quarter percent. It's the Italian market that really is leading us lower. FTSE MIB down by 2.6 percent. Nearly all stocks on the Italian FTSE MIB are in negative territory, in particular the banking sector. Some of those banks losing more than 4 percent. 
that's what you might expect at a time where we see yields going higher and yields going higher in Italy at a faster rate than they're going higher in Germany. That spread is widening. And so here's the uh, Italian two-year yield, 1.53%. And that yield higher by nearly 40 basis points just since the ECB meeting. Now, it's not 2011. We shouldn't get carried away with this story. But a lot of people asking uh, what the ECB is prepared to do if we do see fragmentation around the Eurozone, if we do see uh, stresses in the Eurozone, what they're prepared to do to keep yields under mm. control. And that seems to be where the market's thinking is right now. Credit Suisse, just to wrap up this one for the week, uh, this stock down by another 3% today. We started the week with gloomy thoughts around Credit Suisse because of that profit warning that they delivered once again. Then we got a lift because of speculation about a takeover. Uh, that speculation has been firmly put to bed now, and so the stock retreats once again, Matt. All right, very interesting stuff. I'm looking at break-evens here because um, Mohammed, Mohammed Al Arian yesterday um, told John Farrow he sees inflation possibly moving higher. A lot of big names, um, including Ed Hyman from Evercore ISI, have come out and said inflation has peaked. Let's bring in Shemin Shower Power, Bank of Ireland Global Markets Head of Inflation Trading, and one of the best forecasters of inflation in Bloomberg Records. So, Shemin. What do you think in terms of um, inflation? It looks like companies like Walmart and Target have stockpiled so many uh, T-shirts that they don't see it, but companies like General Motors and Ford and Tesla still can't get enough cars off the lot or on the lot. Uh, hi. Uh, good morning, man. Um, thanks for having me on. Um, I actually agree with uh, Mohamed El Arian, and I think... Um, there is at the moment a bit of a disconnect between uh, the inflation market and uh, nominal rates market. Um, whereas the discussion on the nominal rate side is more focused on the growth slowdown, uh, actually inflation market is much more worried about the um, inflation outlook. Uh, we have been revising higher our projections um, yet again. So uh, we are not in the peak inflation camp uh, and we are not in the camp that believes that the peak uh, central bank hawkishness is actually behind us. Um, today, actually, uh, we are expecting uh, the inflation print uh, to come out on the high side as also well. market expectations range from 8% to 8.5%. We are closer to the higher end there. And um, we believe that, um, especially on the services side, the pressures are there, but also on the commodity side. So obviously, we are seeing brand crude at the moment about $120 per barrel. Um, mm. We are discussing uh, that China will eventually reopen. Uh, U.S. driving season will kick in, and uh, there is huge amount of pent-up uh, travel demand. So we actually see the risk um, of oil prices moving uh, closer to $150 per barrel in the second half of the year. And we believe wow. that the peak of inflation is not behind us, but again in the third okay. quarter, uh, we can see U.S. inflation prints closer to 9%. Oh, sorry, it's closer to 9%, so not the peak then that we're seeing at the moment, Shemin, and, you, no. and you, you've got some clear thoughts then on oil prices. How much of that oil price forecast, though, relies on China recovering? Because we see headlines about reopening in China, and they're quickly followed by further headlines about lockdowns. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there it looks like the um, uh, timeline will be delayed. Uh, but looking at um, uh, energy commodities, that market is super, super tight. And if we also look at the market reaction uh, last week when the OPEC supply increases uh, were brought forward and an increase was announced, uh, actually, market didn't really react to it uh, at all because uh, we see that actually a number of OPEC countries already cannot meet their production quotas. And there are very few countries which still have a spare capacity. And um, we are actually seeing that market to uh, remain very tight. And we are also seeing, obviously, the Russian supply taken out of the market, uh, which contributes to the tightness. Um, so, yes, China will be uh, one of the um, issues, but we still believe that the demand is very strong. And as I said, with the travel demand kicking in as well, we are actually seeing risks on the upside. Well, on the subject of demand and going back to the balance between goods and services, Shemin, we've already seen some demand destruction kicking in for discretionary goods. How far away are we from demand destruction in services as consumers face higher prices for necessities like food and groceries and gas? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we don't think uh, we are uh, at those levels. Obviously, what we are paying a lot of attention is where the real incomes are. And uh, real incomes are getting crushed as the cost of living is increasing very sharply. Um, but uh, we are still believing, especially on the services side, we know that the companies are actually not under pressure and they can pass these cost increases on to final consumers. So 
um, we don't think uh, that pressure will be over. We are still seeing further pressure on services prices in the U.S. going forward. And again, uh, things like airfares and travel-related components like lodging away from home, uh, but also on the housing side, we are still seeing upside pressures and we're not seeing any demand destruction yet. All right, Shemin, thanks so much for joining us. Shemin, show her power there of the Bank of Ireland Global Markets talking to us about inflation. Coming up, we're going to discuss food inflation with Judy Gaines, president of J. Gaines Consulting, and we're going to continue to talk about inflation um, as we wait for the CPI uh, release and probably a little bit after as well. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York. Now, with US CPI due out at 8.30 Eastern time, we focus in on the rising uh, price of food. Last month, we saw a 1% month-over-month increase in food prices. To discuss more, we bring in Judy Gaines-Chase, Jay Gaines Consulting President. Uh, Judy, there are many dimensions to this. There's the pressure that in developed markets people are feeling on the, because real wages are declining in the face of uh, higher costs of living. Then there's the emerging market story, which uh, could be a whole lot uh, more dire. Let's focus Focus on what's happening in developed markets for a moment. How much okay. upward pressure should we consider there is still to come from food price inflation? Or is this something we can say a lot of this has been priced in already? Well, there's two things. First, the prices of the raw ingredients have increased, but they're not at what I would say nosebleed levels, historic levels. What's really causing some of the food in inflation is the increases in packaging and manufacturing costs and rising labor costs for the manufacturers. And so it's become a tsunami of price rises, not just in having a quick pop in sugar or cocoa prices or coffee prices. There, there's more to it this time. So uh, is there anything that the government can do about it? No. I mean, it really has to run its course. And... The key part to that is, in terms of the raw ingredients, we need good weather. So we had some pretty um, poor growing conditions last year in Brazil, for instance, which is the largest producer of sugar and coffee in the world. You had a extended drought and you had a record number of frosts last July. And so that damaged production. So we need to have the higher prices because producers to take action to increase supply, and at the same time, higher prices also cause demand to shrink. And what, it takes time. What's happening, Judith, I'm from the great state of Ohio, but I don't go home that much these days. What's happening to the American farmer? I mean, for years, um, they were subsidized, um, they were paid not to grow, uh, they were throwing away um, the excess food that they, that they did actually harvest. What, are the, what is the American farmer doing right now? Well, the American farmer was trying to plant as much as they possibly could. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that there's been this dome of heat that slowed plantings and caused some problems. And, you know, they, they hope for rain because that's what's really needed. So, for example, Texas, uh, where you have a huge pound crop, yeah. only 15% is actually emerging right now. So you need to have the good weather to get the crop started well on, on the a subject good note. judy of weather of course we talk a lot about the issues the food supply is facing now in terms of the war in ukraine the labor shortage that is out there fertilizer issues all these things that seem supply side driven at this moment in time and yet we are also in a world in which the planet is warming weather events are more extreme including drought i mean how do you think about longer term ramifications of climate change and how it's going to affect the ag market for years to come not just right now well, one of the things that has to happen is technology has to catch up. So there's that's in place already, where you have more disease-resistant resistant varieties, you have shorter growing cycles. So seed manufacturers um, are working within the industry to try and create 
plants that can tolerate some of the new extremes in the weather. Some of the weather is just based on cycles and you have confluence of long-term cycles that impact the market. Mm. So for instance, we had low sunspots last year and you had this hole in the solar vortex and that helped to usher in a lot of the cold weather which caused the damage yeah. to the coffee and sugar crop. This year, it seems that we're now back to neutral conditions. And yes. so La Nina is going away and we're looking now towards El Nino. Judy, it seems like there's a lot of environmental factors then to consider. There's also war in Europe, and that's cited by a lot of people as putting upward pressure, of course, on, on food prices. I, I saw um, an assessment by the U UN Maritime Organization that to take mines away from all of the Ukrainian ports where a lot of grain and other products are trapped would take months. Do we have any sense of what is trapped there and how long we have to get it out before, it starts to ha before we start to price in even higher food prices? Um, that I'm not an expert on, but I, I can tell you that other countries will pick up the slack because they understand what's happening. And that's why, say, sugar, my areas of expertise, say sugar and coffee, um, well, coffee's not really in, impacted because it's not a major growing area. But as far as sugar, trade flows get adjusted. And we are shifting to a small surplus for the 22-23 season. And so that's not going to have a long-term impact. You know, if you look back, um, I've been covering these markets for almost 40 years. And I remember when Cuban sugar production collapsed with the fall of the Soviet Union, the breakup of the Soviet Union. And Thailand started increasing their sugar so dramatically we wound up with oversupply. Finally, Judy, how does the strength of the dollar factor into all of this? So when the dollar is strong, then people aren't buying U.S. commodities. And it also behooves producers to want to sell faster. Right now, we have a situation where we watch very carefully the relationship between the Brazilian real, the Brazilian currency, and the U.S. dollar. And when the Brazilian real has been very weak, then you have stepped up exports from these countries and that helps to depress the market. Judy, thanks so much for your time. Judy Gaines Chase, J Gaines Consulting President. Thanks for joining us here on this program. Coming up on the program, the future of finance. Goldman Sachs CEO David Solomon reveals his best guess about what changes will be driving the industry in the next 30 years. We've seen big changes over the last uh, 20 or so. What do the next 30 years have in store? We will get analysis. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lyons with Anna Edwards in London. Now, the internet, smartphones, the euro, and cryptocurrencies are just a few of the innovations that have revolutionized markets in the past three decades. And Bloomberg's Shanali Basik asked some top executives for their best guesses about what might drive the biggest changes between now and 2052. Here's what Goldman Sachs CEO David Solomon had to say. The big macro trends are um, or around, you know, around AI, the big macro trends around uh, biopharma and uh, and and bio, you know, biotech investments in uh, trying to find ways for all our energy sources to be greener over time. Now, Solomon's comments are featured in the June-July issue of Bloomberg Markets, the magazine, which is actually celebrating its 30th anniversary, which is why Shanali is looking out over the next 30 years. And Shanali Bosick is here with us for more. So, Shanali, it's a really great piece. Of course, you can find it in the magazine. You can find it on the Bloomberg. Let's talk about some of the takeaways. What role did energy play when you talk to these big players? It was so interesting because three out of the six CEOs we spoke to did talk about the energy transition and said that it would be one of the biggest innovations of our time. So when David Solomon spoke about it, he spoke about it in the vein of public-private partnerships being needed. David Siegel of Two Sigma also said that the government needs to play some role. And the CEO of Macquarie talked about it in the vein of agriculture changing. Uh, but it's clear that 
the energy transition is one of the things that people see as in the early stages similar mm. to where the internet was in 1992. Yeah, and really interesting to think what public money might be needed for, I suppose, in that concept, uh, context, Janali, whether it's the new technology or whether it's helping the old technology limp on as long as we need it to. Now, how big a role did crypto and maybe, I should say, blockchain play in these conversations? It was incredible. You had the CEO of NASDAQ saying that the technology exists for every asset in the world to be digitized in some way. And the CEO of Citigroup, Jane Fraser, said that the, the world will be virtual and boundless and we're, we're moving towards a virtual, boundless economy. David Solomon also uh, talked about it. This is what he had to say. I happen to think that blockchain technology is an early ver version of technologies that it will ultimately be used to further digitize the infrastructure of financial services. Because there, there, while there are a lot of good things with, with blockchain, it's not a great technology for a large number of transactions at a very high speed. So you did see him uh, talk about the limitations here as well, and that's scalability. That's something that Adina Friedman of NASDAQ also talked about, as well as crime management is what NASDAQ is looking at. The fact that if crime management isn't taken seriously, that's the big caveat to blockchain adoption. But, you know, let's see how this moves on. The idea here that every asset in the world could be digitized is something that a lot of people spoke about. Uh, David Siegel of Two Sigma also said that blockchain could be a major technology moving forward, similar to the Internet. But you can't take for granted here that some of these things may not be adopted as fast as uh, one can expect. And that's really the big hurdle in the next OK, so several people talked about blockchain. Several people talked about the energy transition. Was there any wild outlier okay. in your conversations? What was the craziest thing you heard? Uh, the craziest thing, it's interesting. This is not the craziest thing, but an undertone. Something that was recognized but not really played up a lot was medical technology in the wake of mm -hmm. the pandemic and mRNA technology. Uh, a lot of the executives brought that up. and the potential for there to be medical technology that changes the course of human history. Mm -hmm. So let's see in the scope of priorities where that takes off in terms of capital allocation and the amount of public and private investment that goes into it. Shanali, thank you very much. Thanks to Shanali Basak for bringing us her story there. You can read more in the June July issue of Bloomberg Markets, currently celebrating then its 30th birthday. And Kaylee, we're looking ahead to CPI numbers. We're looking ahead to the inflation print out of the United States. I asked a guest earlier, you know, is it dollar yen you focus on? What's the asset that's going to be really uh, watched through this? He, he was saying that for him it was uh, credit spreads, high yield mm. credit in particular, was where he was going to focus. Well, and it'll be interesting too to see how the market would react to a cold print versus a hot print. Remember, we're still expecting it to have an eight handle, but if this data sends some kind of signal that the peak of inflation is not yet actually behind us, that it may still be in front mm. of us. I think that's really what uh, would see the outsized market reaction. So really looking forward to that uh, data coming up in just about two yeah. and a half hours time. And Matt Miller is actually going to be John joining Lisa Bromowitz and Tom Keen on surveillance today to talk about it. So you know we'll turn it, tune in to whatever Matt has to say, Anna. We absolutely will. Bloomberg Surveillance is up next then with Tom, Lisa and Matt. They'll take you through uh, all the details of that inflation print. This is Bloomberg.